He is the very prototype of the flamboyant high-tech executive. Yet for the last 30 years, he has fought and survived one of the bloodiest and most unforgiving battles in business history. Next, a conversation with AMD founder and chairman, Jerry Sanders. A national broadcast of Betting It All, The Entrepreneurs has been made possible by the following corporate funders. Applied Materials, producer of systems and services for the worldwide semiconductor industry. Applied Materials makes the systems that make the chips that make the products that change the world. Applied Materials, the information age starts here. Additional funding provided by Hewlett Packard, the original company of inventors who celebrate the men and women everywhere who invent the ways we live and work. Hewlett Packard urges you, keep inventing. By Mayfield, a recognized Silicon Valley-based venture capital firm creating revolutionary companies for the 21st century in communications and the Internet. And by Goldman Sachs, a global investment bank and securities firm advising and financing leading technology companies worldwide. Goldman Sachs is proud to support innovation and technology. And there's these two giant millstones sitting out there. One of them's called Microsoft, the other one's called Intel. And anybody who's gotten in their path has been either crushed under them or crushed between them. And it's, you're sort of like Ishmael, you know, I alone survived to tell the tale. Why you over everybody else? Modesty forbids a reply, but let's just say determination. Well, I'll be modest for you. Bob Noyce said that he thought you might be the smartest man in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Regis McKenna said the same thing. Well, that's very kind. Um, is it smarts? Is it cleverness? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I think, first of all, it's character. I think, you know, what it's all about really is character and commitment. You know, when I look for a leader in my business, when I look for a guy I want to give an important position to or responsibility to, first thing I go for is character. Second thing I go for is commitment and accountability. Then I look for, basically, you know, leadership skills, and then what is the skill set? And, you know, I like to talk about Character, commitment, capability. Why can't I just once catch a break on this stuff? I remember at the very beginning of AMD, Intel, how long did it take Intel to raise the money to get funded? An afternoon? I was told, you know, less than a day. Okay, how long did it take you? It took me the better part of six months. Yeah, and you were like sleeping on somebody's couch or something Oh, I, it too. was awful. It, it, it was absolutely grim. In fact, where the reason we ultimately raised the money, and I have to say this, and I'll never forget these guys, people who knew me, I mean, guys like Seymour Schweber, guys like Tony Hamilton. In fact, Dr. Robert Noyce, Bob Noyce, the founder of Intel, put in $25,000. Hey, I only had to raise $1.5 million. Seems like, you know, mice nuts today. But $1.5 million was very hard to raise in those days. Do you ever, like, wish for some repose in all of this? Have you ever had a chance to stop? No, actually, I missed that opportunity, Mike. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I had the chance. Um, as you probably recall, you know, we'd been engaged with uh, legal battles with Intel from about 86 to 94 when we won the microcode case and we also won the arbitration. Uh, and in that time frame of 91, 92, 93, 94, AMD was making a lot of money. Uh, we actually made over a billion dollars in operating profit in about a three-year period. And I was very proud of that billion dollars in operating profit. I was feeling very good about what we were doing. But always over my head was the sort of Damocles that if we lost the court case, AMD was history. Mm -hmm. The damages that would have, been, would have been so great, you know, that AMD would have been gone. And so there was a, you know, a, a tenseness and a uh, tautness in my stomach for all those good years. So, yeah, from the beginning, it's been a grunt. I mean, I don't know what, what made me decide that my life should always be about making love standing up in a hammock, but this is the way that my life has worked out. about fun. You were almost synonymous with having fun in Silicon Valley. 
in the early days. I mean, I, we, I don't, I don't, we, I don't want to go all the way back to like your, your, the myth of the pink pants at IBM that caused the big scandal at Fairchild. No truth in that whatsoever, by the way. But I mean, you, you know, the, you know the rep you had. You were the, you were the high living, fun loving. Sales I'm still guy a high living, fun loving guy. Yeah, but I mean, the early days of AMD, the big parties, uh, you know, the 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 giant cash awards to employees, all this, all this fun stuff, and you know, the pictures of you on 60 Minutes and the Bentley and all that. Is it still fun, or is it just? What's well, big hard responsibility work? now? It, right now, I mean, are you still having fun? Uh, I'm not having much fun right now. Fun to me was, um, you know. I love to travel. I love the south of France. You know, I love wonderful cars, you know. Uh, I love the good life. But the realities are, there's a part of me which is just duty driven. You know, and I'm, I'm determined to fulfill my dream at AMD. Where did that come from? Where did that, that sense of duty come from? Well, I think it came from my upbringing in Chicago. Uh, my grandfather and my grandmother uh, were, uh, you know, good God-fearing people. My grandfather had a great belief that uh, good things only came from hard work for the what, average person. What did your grandfather do? My grandfather was the assistant electrical engineer for the city of Chicago. He did and, the trolleys or something, didn't he? Didn't that's he my the... dad. That's my dad. My grandfather actually is an unusual human being. My grandfather actually got a college degree at a, uh, a school called Armour Institute, which is now the Illinois Institute of Technology. Of course, in those days, uh, the only thing they dealt with was direct current, so he had a much more limited uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, curricula than I did. But my grandfather uh, did not have any of his children complete college. I mean, they, he did not see them complete college. He always felt that they had given up too soon. He, my grandfather's a very harsh taskmaster, never give you any encouragement. I mean, uh, um, you know, on, on public television, I can't use the words he used to use, say, but basically said, you know, you're a shanty Irishman, and you'll wind up nothing more than a pile of, you yeah. know, and I thought, gee, that's a great encouraging thing. So I guess my first motivation was to show my grandfather he was wrong and that I was going to be a heck of a lot more than he ever thought. Was your grandmother a countervailing force? Was she balanced oh, all absolutely. this? Oh, absolutely. My grandmother was the most loving, wonderful person uh, until I was 13 years old. And at thir Because my, my uh, mother and father divorced when I was quite young. And about the time I was four or five, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, raised me. And my, um, my mother and father remarried and each had five children with their second mate, leaving me and one brother as sort of the abandoned uh, uh, mistakes of the first marriage. My grandmother was very happy to raise me when I was a little boy and, you know, up till about the time that uh, I was replaced by my father's first son from his second wife, at which time much more desirable to be uh, a grandmother to a one-year-old into a pimply-faced uh, adolescent rebel, you know, uh, questioning everything that he'd ever been taught, which is about what I was when I got to high school. Uh, your brother, though, your brother did not grow up with you? Was he raised in the same house? No, my brother, my one full-blood brother, uh, was raised by my maternal grandmother on a policeman's widow's pension. So, in a sense, you two have literally grew up in entirely different environments. Yes, we did. But your grandpa made you, wanted you to go to college. My grandfather told me if I didn't go to school, I was worth less than dirt. Okay. And um, he didn't care what I studied in school as long as it was something I could make a living at. And his definition of making a living was be an engineer. You can get a job. You can get, make money. You can survive and you won't be a drag on me as you have been for your entire 21 years of your life. When I graduated from college, no one came to my graduation. Nobody would even go as far as the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, a scant 120-mile drive away. And when I came home, my grandfather presented me with a bill, and it was a listing of all of the canned goods, uh, charges for the laundry my grandmother had done for me, which I used to send home from college, and this is how much he felt I owed him. And he hoped I would pay it back when I was uh, able. Well, how bitter did this make you? It made me laugh. Did it really? Absolutely made me laugh. Because it was just so outrageous. It was just so outrageous. I mean, you know, how could my grandfather do that? I mean, I, I knew in his own way he loved me. I knew he was proud of me. And I think what I was most impressed with was he kept such meticulous <laughs> records. And I thought, God, he's not even a Virgo, you know.
to be an engineer at this point, or did you want to go to Hollywood? Oh, you wanted I, I, to be an actor, didn't you? Well, what I wanted to do was be rich and famous and have beautiful women on my arm. You wanted to be which is all we can really say on television. Right. right? Well, you you wanted to be Ty Harden, didn't you? At that oh, point wow, in your, your life? memory's in, in, incredible. Well, what happened was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Who knows what they want to do when they're in their teens? You know, I, I just knew I wanted a better life. Um, I had been, um, uh, because I always, always shot my mouth off. I, I learned to be a little bit, you know, more circumspect, and with maturity comes a certain amount of control. But um, I was always quite quick with the quip or the remark, which caused me a number of occasions to get into fights with people who were bigger and stronger than I was. Right. And so, um, I started working out and uh, trying to get more physically fit so I could better defend myself. And in so doing, I learned about, you know, Santa Monica's Muscle Beach, and I thought, yeah, I'd like to make a trip to Muscle Beach. So when I was, you know, in my uh, mid-teens, I went to Santa Monica, Muscle Beach, and I wasn't so much interested in Muscle Beach as I was interested in, wow, Southern California is phenomenal. What a great place to live. And what I really liked about it was the transparent society. In Chicago, where I went to school, everybody knew what your background must be. If you went to Lindblom High School on the south side of Chicago, everyone knew that you didn't have the same background as someone went to New Trier in Winnetka. You know, so I didn't like that, but you know, where you were automatically classified. My grandfather uh, was adamant about uh, diction and grammar, pointing out that uh, people could tell where you were from, you know, by how you talked and how you spoke and. Uh, my neighborhood was a D's, Dem, and Do's neighborhood, you know, right. and um, I was really amazed that... Um, you, were the lace, <clears throat> you were the lace curtain house in the neighborhood? We were the lace curtain house in the neighborhood. My grandmother kept a very fine house, and my grandfather permitted uh, no D's, Dem, or Do's in our house. So uh, I wanted to go to California because I thought it would be a great place to live. I uh, took a job of a number of offers I had at Douglas Aircraft Company because it was in Santa Monica, which was close to the beach. And, yeah, I had, you know, my childhood fantasies that... Uh, Someday I'd, uh, you know, maybe I could be an actor. And I actually um, was introduced to somebody who could have um, been very influential, a woman who was a widow of an important um, movie producer. And I probably could have used her uh, influence to become an actor uh, if she wouldn't have discouraged me by pointing out to me that what did I possibly have going for me that would make me an actor? She said, you know, I was just talking to a fine young man, and he's ten times better looking than you are, and he can't even get a job. And his name was Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. I'll never forget that day. And I thought, wow. Once, uh, you know, of course, later on in life when 77 Sunset Strip was a big deal and Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. was one of the stars, I said, you know what? She's wrong. He's 100 times better looking than I am. So she said, about the only thing you could be, Jerry, is a cowboy. And, Pass, you know, yeah. You know, so I said, well, you know, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. But. Now, before this occurred, there had been this, there was a major turning point in your life. And that was, you were almost killed. Yeah, I was. It turns out, uh, it's odd you mention that, because uh, that had something to do with why Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. was 10 times better looking than I was, because my nose had gotten, gotten messed up in a, in a pretty severe fight. It's kind of funny, you know, a few years ago I was in Hong Kong, and I, was, I took the time to go to one of these fortune tellers. You know, it was kind of fun. And the fortune teller told me that I had two lifelines. And one of them went on for a very long time, possibly even to the century mark, was a little obscure, but the other lifeline ended when I was 18. And what happened to me when I was 18? They wanted to know because this guy was, didn't even speak English, uh, and when I was 18... That's pretty I, accurate. Yeah, it was you incredible. You got last rights when you yeah, were 18. I, that's right, I did. I was, um, again, I was um, at a party. I was home from college, and I went to a high school football game. And, of course, I was no longer in high school, but it was at the, you know, with the team that... Um, the school I'd gone to, and I was there with a couple of guys that I didn't know really well who had been football players uh, at Limbloom uh, when I was in high school, when I was there. And uh, I went with those guys to a party afterwards, and this party, unfortunately, was uh, dominated by a, uh, a gang, and the gang's name was the Shy Nine, which obviously stands for Chicago Nine. Um, and I didn't know anything about the Shy Nine, but one of the guys I was with... Um, had a high degree of interest in a girl who was at the party who happened to be uh, presumably the property of the leader of the Shy Nine. And this guy's name, never forget this guy's name, was Bob Biocek. And Bob Biocek uh, decided he was going to fight with my friend. And my friend uh, went outside and they started fighting. And 
it, it wasn't going particularly well for um, either one of them, and so Bob Biocek, the gang leader, decided to have a few friends help him finish off my friend. You got the rest of the nine? Uh, there were nine of them, there were four or five of them, and I made, again, kind of my character, you know, like uh, I, I jumped in to help him. And I really thought that we could make a difference, and uh, to my surprise, uh, my friend ran off and escaped and uh, left me there, and these guys decided, well, I was the next best thing to him, so uh, they did me up pretty well. They, you know, broke my nose, fractured my skull, kicked in my ribs, carved me up with a beer can. Fortunately, I had a coat on, so it didn't make any lasting scars on my back, but, uh, and they dumped me in a garbage can, which I thought was a pretty nasty thing to do. I look back now, it's amazing I survived that. Fortunately, one of the guys at the party was a next door neighbor and he put me in the trunk of his car, having extracted me from the garbage can, right. took me to the little company of Mary Hospital out of 95th in Evergreen Park, and dropped me off in the emergency section and said uh, he was in a car accident. <laughs> well, of course I wasn't, but uh, there I was unconscious with a fractured skull, and so uh, they put me in the emergency ward and he called somebody, I don't remember, it's been so long ago. I was only 17 years old, I think. I might have just turned 18. I think I just turned 18. And to make a long story short, they gave me the last rites, and uh, a few days later I came out of the coma, and there I was with my skull caved in. It looked like somebody had actually taken a silver dollar and impressed it in the center of my forehead and just pounded it in there. So fortunately, uh, it's gotten a little better, but I've always had this broken nose and always have to look from left to right instead of right to left. Did that change you? I mean, did, did, did your motivations change at that point? I mean, this is, this is a fundamental turning point in, in your life. Well, it was like before and after. Yeah, it was. It, it turns out, what I remember most about that was that I'd been betrayed by a friend. Yeah. And he wasn't my best friend. He wasn't a guy I knew that well, but I'd gone to help him. He and let you my, down. my reward for that was he let me down. He let me down big time. And I thought about it afterwards, you know, and actually I saw him afterwards. He told me, you know, that you know, he had a broken jaw from a football injury and his jaw was wired. And, could he really been hurt if he'd stuck around? And I looked at this guy and I thought, this is just ridiculous. You let me down. You copped out. You know, I went to your aid. You betrayed me. So it taught me a couple of things. Number one, it taught me, you know, maybe you shouldn't always count on people that you don't know. Right. That's where this character thing comes in. You know, character really counts to me. This guy showed no character whatsoever. And the other thing it taught me, I think, was that um, life isn't fair. And I've dedicated my, I think the turning point for me was, I am, you know, just an advocate of fairness in everything. And I remember that uh, when these guys were rounded up, and I guess it was the district attorney or the city attorney was going to prosecute, he said, you know, there's no real point in prosecuting. These guys are already all out on probation. You know, their families have no money, so there's no... In fact, in those days, it never even occurred to us to it's sue it. for damages other than maybe to get the medical bills paid. You know, that my grandfather once again had to pay which is unfortunate, um, and he just said, you know, these are just bad guys, and, you know, so we'll get a guilty plea, but they'll just get more probation. They'll just extend their probation. So the third lesson period. was there's no justice. There's no justice. So there was no, and that, I didn't think that was fair. You know, I, I thought that, that just really wasn't right. But there right. was justice because didn't Bob Biosic? Yeah, your, your memory is very good. Bob Biosic was found dead in a Denver, uh, you know, street fight some, you know, as a result of a Denver street fight some years later. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, you know, uh, Although in some of my more uh, romantic moments, if that's the right word, maybe not romantic, maybe fantastic moments, I thought of writing a fictionalized account of my life where I had something to do with that. But, you know, the realities are um, I've never let myself be burdened with negativity. I think it just uh, it drags you down. You know, I think learn from your mistakes, learn from your experiences and move forward. This is headquarters for Fairchild Semiconductor, a division of Fairchild Camera and Instrument Corporation. Fairchild. Is Fairchild, Fairchild's a company of myth now. It doesn't even exist. You can go out to where it was and it's a vacant lot. Was it everything that the myth says it was? I mean... It was magic. It was everything the myth said. The images, this incredible accumulation of I just, got, of I just got goose flesh. Just thinking about yeah, Fairchild. It was just incredible. There's never been anything like it before, never been anything like it since. Could it have made it? Twenty years ago, you told me yes, it could have. It could have I was, was going to say, if, sure. no, I was going to sure? say, if I would have run it, it would have made it. You were too young. 
I know. They never gave me a, a chance, though. Hey, yeah. they should have given me a chance. I was a baby when I started AMD, too. Did but I made it happen, and they said it couldn't be done. Did Fairchild betray you? In the Fairchild end? didn't, but uh, Les Hogan did. But, uh, you know, people make mistakes. He's told me later that he regretted it was the biggest mistake he ever made in his professional life. But, um, yeah, he fired me. Uh, you know, as, again, here I am at Fairchild doing a great job, uh, albeit with a certain number of detractors, because, again, I had not gotten quite control of the things I said. I was an iconoclast. When the emperor had no clothes, I was the first one to point it out. Well, it's amazing that anybody, that you, could be too wild for that company, which is like the wildest I, company anybody's ever heard I of. I wasn't too wild for Fairchild. I was too wild for Les Hogan. So you get fired from Fairchild, and now you're out there, you're on, sleeping on the couch, <laughs> trying to raise the money, and you build AMD. And it's well, been a race. Was it crucial to you in creating AMD that you correct the failures of Fairchild? It was crucial to me that first and foremost I demonstrate to myself that they were wrong. You know, I think um, there's always been a little bit of insecurity in me, probably always will be. And I did wonder, were, were they right? Was Les right? Was I the wrong guy to lead the marketing organization of an industry-leading technology company? When did, when did you know that he was wrong? When AMD crossed a billion dollars? I think he, I knew he was wrong when we went public. Because to go public when we went public in 1972... Pretty rare event. You had to achieve something. You know, people talk, you know, but they pontificate. Now it's three kids with nose rings, and they're six well, months later, hey, they're listen, public. Hey, listen, that's what's happening today. I, I don't begrudge them that, but I think they should get real. I mean, I read that article in, um, a, in, a, in another magazine about uh, an I, the nightmare of an IPO, you know, that this guy had to spend two weeks on pins and needles and going through a road show and four weeks of boredom while they were doing the due diligence. And after four years of work, you know, he finally got his $100 million. Well, you know, hell, I've been working for over 30 years, and $100 million is not there after taxes yet. If you were uh, to see the young Jerry Sanders down there in your cantilevered home in uh, Southern California, 25 <laughs> years old, uh, the, you know, the hot young salesman for Fairchild, what would you tell him? I'd tell him to um, pay at least as much attention to the um, uh, base camp as he does to climbing the mountain. Uh, I've been blessed by have, having had uh, two wonderful wives in my life. I had a wife for a long time, gave me three wonderful children. Uh, I think the pressures of business contributed substantially to the uh, dissolution of that marriage. But the realities are, it turned out to be a blessing because I've stayed close to my kids uh, and it's allowed me to meet a new woman and fall in love, get married, and have this incredible, you know, second family. It's, it's so, uh, I guess what I would tell the guys just, but pay attention to base camp. And that goes now. So I've got to pay attention to my base camp. Now, I'm still out climbing mountains and I intend to continue to climb the mountain, uh, but I'm paying attention to my base camp. Would you be an entrepreneur again? By now, you would have been chairman of Motorola. Oh, actually, I think... You would have been chairman of Motorola if you'd stayed by now, given uh, what you've proven your skills. Would, you know, it would have been it, better it, to have gotten the gold watch? No, it turns out that, um, you know, when I worked at Fairchild, I worked with a guy named Don Valentine. Actually, I worked for Don Valentine. In fact, unfortunately, uh, Don and I didn't stay close uh, after um, he left. Of course, he's been phenomenally successful as a venture capitalist right. with Sequoia. And Don said something a long time ago, you know, what gave him pleasure was collecting stock certificates in a safe deposit box. And I looked at him and I thought, wow, that wouldn't give me any pleasure at all. What I liked is collecting experiences. And so the reason I'm a fun guy or have been a fun guy is I like traveling the world. You know, I, you know, I, I enjoyed going to our plants in Penang. I enjoy, you know, going to the south of France. Who wouldn't? You know, I enjoyed going out to the countryside outside of London and bidding on, you know, uh, antiques, but I, I enjoy experiences. And what I regret is that I don't have more free time. So when do you stay on that beach in Malibu and say, I've won, I can walk away now? Um, I've always done things with numbers. And I guess that when we're a $5 billion company, I'll feel like I now can consider that it's now time to turn over the baton to the next guy.
national broadcast of Betting It All, The Entrepreneurs has been made possible by the following corporate funders. Applied Materials, producer of systems and services for the worldwide semiconductor industry. Applied Materials makes the systems that make the chips that make the products that change the world. Applied Materials, the information age starts here. Additional funding provided by Hewlett Packard, the original company of inventors who celebrate the men and women everywhere who invent the ways we live and work. Hewlett Packard urges you, keep inventing. By Mayfield, a recognized Silicon Valley-based venture capital firm creating revolutionary companies for the 21st century in communications and the Internet. And by Goldman Sachs, a global investment bank and securities firm advising and financing leading technology companies worldwide. Goldman Sachs is proud to support innovation and technology.